This week we talk about a pirate with a shocking history that also may be turned into a scary ghost. Ooh! Hello, hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Swerve Podcast. If you're a first time listener and you're wondering what you've stumbled across, we're the Swerve Podcast and we are two random guys on a mission to understand everything in the universe one obscure topic at a time so our premise here is extremely simple every week we pick a topic that we don't know anything about something that swerves off the mainstream path we research it then we discuss it on the fly during the podcast but before we get into today's topic i think is though you have some words to share yeah uh just real quick before we get into it i just want to let our listeners know that we do have a patreon Now, this Patreon has two tiers, the $1 Ride the Wave tier, which gives you shoutouts on the podcast and access to all of our bonus monthly episodes. And then we have the $3 Slap the Ass tier, which gives you all of that above, but you also get early access to all of our episodes, so you'll be in the know a few days before anyone else. Uh, Other ways to support us, um, financially through Buy Me a Coffee, and then other ways to support us non-financially, just through our social medias, interacting, liking and sharing this podcast with your friends and family, because if you you enjoy it, uh, they probably will too. But we do have a second component to this podcast as well, and that is that uh, we like to drink, and we like to experiment with new drinks. So this week, we're actually recording in person, so we'll start off with a Patron shot. Yeah, I mean, for listeners, this is a pretty special thing. Usually, we record virtually, but it's the Christmas holidays, so we're in the same place at the same time. So here we go. We got some fucking Patron. Cheers. Jeez. <laughs> I spilt all over myself. I didn't even see. <laughs> well, yeah, other than that, uh, on, on, on the lineup, we have these holiday Grinch drinks. So it's just green. Uh, for some reason, we really like green drinks on the podcast. So uh, we'll share that recipe on our Instagram. So uh, stay, in, stay in the loop for that. Yeah, no, this is good. This is good. Some Christmas cheer going on. Um, yeah. And then for me, I have a classic Stella Artois um, to drink after that. I'm sporting a, I don't even really know what this is. This is called a rail yard brewing peach sour the reason i got this drink this is some kind of beer it's actually not bad it tastes like uh well it's sour obviously and it tastes like peach but but um it has a bunch of ufos on it and shit so i was like it kind of looks like our logo (laughs) it kind of looks like our logo so i bought it and i'm gonna be dabbling with that as well on deck during this podcast yeah so keep an eye out on instagram and uh we might feature that peach sour drink yeah yeah yeah. we should say that we do feature our drinks on our social medias so if you're interested in anything we've tried or you have recommendations we usually post them on there you can check it out but um i don't know i guess we could get into today's topic already yeah it's pretty cool when i didn't know anything about it okay let's let's get into the basics here so i want to first say this is a so we're talking about a guy named Jean Lafitte. Is it Jean Lafette. Jean Lafette. <laughs> Say it again so I get it in my head. Jean Lafette. Jean Lafette. Yeah. So this guy, Jean Lafette, he's basically, he's like the last great pirate king of America. It sounds crazy. I mean, we're talking about a pirate. I didn't think we'd ever talk about a pirate on this podcast. But when I went through this topic, it's actually quite crazy. There's a lot of shit that this guy has done. But before we continue through the basics, I want to say this was a listener requested topic. We had this topic requested by Justin M. I don't know if he wants his last name sh- shared, so I'm just going to keep it M. So shout out to Justin M for uh, bringing this topic to our attention. But this Jean Lafitte, if I were just to break it down quick before we get into this, he essentially he made a fortune controlling the Louisiana swamps in a pirate ring, and he also helped america defeat the british so he was a smuggler essentially in the initial days like just a huge epic smuggler he had this whole ring that he controlled in louisiana he commanded a thousand men like like a thousand pirates basically it's crazy he escaped jail 
He once put a hit on the governor of Louisiana and then later became a governor himself. And he also he has like buried treasure and shit. As all pirates do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's kind of I don't know. He's kind of like all over the place. Real life uh, Captain Sparrow. <laughs> so I want to mention there was just to set this up. The height of piracy was kind of in the 1700s. So this was actually earlier than uh, Jean Lafitte. He he was kind of late to the party. He was operating like 1810 to 1812. So he's like 100 years kind of like after the main pirate stuff. Like Because I think like Blackbeard and stuff, they were all earlier than him. So he actually is like, I don't know, one of the last pirates. I don't know. I'm not that I'm a pirate expert. Maybe <laughs> I don't actually know. There could be other pirates. We could we could say confidently last North American pirate probably yeah probably yeah because there's still like Somali pirates today yeah that's true <laughs> the last great American pirate yeah Jean Lafitte Jean Lafitte so he's essentially he was a pirate turned patriot he was an ally for the United States um, in a few wars which we'll get into and basically because he helped the United States they. They ended up cutting him some slack and pardoning him for a lot of his crimes that he was a part of. He was in the War of 1812, uh, the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. He assisted General Andrew Jackson. Fuck me. What the hell? That Patron already (laughs) got me. He assisted General Andrew Jackson to defeat the British. And he did a lot of pirate shit. And they, they ended up pardoning him. He actually got a pardon by the President of the United States for his efforts, which is kind of crazy. Um, cause like they won't even pardon Edward Snowden for fuck's sakes. Yeah. But <laughs> this Kim is- Kardashian needs to get on his case to try and get him pardoned. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not black, so she won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so then he's French, but yeah. <laughs> she mean- was robbed in Paris. So she hates French. People. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. But that's, it's a good fact. Um, so this guy, he's kind of, a. I mean, there's so much we're going to get into with him, but I just want to, again, paint a couple highlights. He's just like a straight up badass. Like one of the things I found when I was doing the initial research, I found, uh, so he, there was a, a, the governor of Louisiana was advertising a $500 reward for Lafitte's capture. And in, when he, John Lafitte heard of this, he was like, he turned around and put out a bounty for the governor for $5,000. Yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> it's like, no, we're going to get your head. But yeah, apparently at that time, like he was already loved in New Orleans and stuff. So like the people didn't want to turn against him and they were like, oh, fuck the governor. And plus it's like 10 times the amount, yeah. 10 times the reward for the governor's head. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's like, I can't imagine. Well, yeah, I don't think you could do that today. No, <laughs> <laughs> can't even make a video of yourself saying that you're going to assassinate the president (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's just he's this is the type of guy he is i had some uh other information about him he was kind of uh like you just said is like the public kind of liked him um he was described as like a romantic figure he was tall slender and handsome with dark hair and eyes and he he charmed numerous aristocratic women so it kind of sounded like he was uh I don't know, like charismatic and like kind of moving in and out of, what would you say? Like, well, I guess the Pussy. aristocracy, but oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this guy fucked. This yeah. guy fucked. He was a, he was a smooth talker. You could say a ladies man, uh, mm-hmm. just a person that you kind of look up to. Like, uh, what do you mean? Where are we going with this? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It was just like a, <laughs> he just fucked. Love. This is a person with a lot of confidence, and then he operated yep. that way, and people saw it, and people gravitate towards that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. He. Uh, so the other thing that's interesting, he is a pirate, obviously, but <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't wear an eye patch, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he had an eye patch, so he's not a pirate. <laughs> But he was a seaman, so. Oh, yeah, that sounds about right. But what I kind what I kind of got from him was he's more like of a pirate manager than he was a pirate. 
he kind of, like we were saying with the aristocracy, he was kind of rubbing elbows with the politicians, community leaders, and uh, like the naval officers. So he, and he was known for hosting parties. And I guess he was like really well-mannered. He was like a pirate pimp, you know? Yeah. Where's my money? <laughs> Bitch better have my money. <laughs> so he kind of like, he also was a politician later. So he, he, uh, like I was saying, he was attacking a governor, or at least put a bounty out on a governor, but then he later became a governor. So it's like, he's a pirate, he's a patriot, he's a politician. A lot of alliteration there, but that's kind of what he was doing. Yeah. I guess, like, it, it is well noted that he was, uh, like, a well-spoken individual and had, like, very ni- very polite manners and stuff like that. And it kind of aids him when he is, like, talking to a- Andrew Jackson or the president. Um, he's kind of able to sway their opinion and, you know, get them on his side. Um, but as well, you know, if he's trying to attract aristocratic women, then... Like his ability to finesse them and like, yeah, talk to them, uh, it it aids him greatly. So. Well, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, when people see like someone, uh, what would you say, like with women flocking over them, they automatically get like uh, boosted. I would say in the hierarchy. Yeah, I would. I would say. So, just coming out of the basics here before we get into some of the the detailed aspects of this uh the history of this fucking pirate he basically like to put it in a nutshell he fought a bunch of wars he stole everyone's shit he got away with everything and then he like weaseled his way into the aristocracy and then he stole more shit and then he got away that's like actually what happened this is this guy's life yeah like he just got away with everything he he just did everything and like we'll talk about it but that's that's where we're at and like i said i didn't I I st- I can't believe we're talking about a fucking pirate today because fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like a <laughs> doesn't seem like a real topic just because it's been like like 200 know. years. Yeah. It's a pirate. It's pretty cool though. Yeah, he's like legitimately a uh, like a real pirate of the Cari- what's that movie? Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, Johnny Depp. Yeah. He's Jack like Sparrow. Yeah, they're pretty much the same guy. Yeah. Pretty much. Except I think Jean Lafitte is actually more badass because he did more shit, which we'll get into. Like, wasn't uh, Johnny Depp kind of like a drunk in that? Where this guy's like a fine-mannered, like, well-spoken pirate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really watch those movies, so. I only saw the first one. So I don't know. Or that squid beard guy, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> that's who we're talking beard. about today <laughs> okay so uh, i want i don't have a lot about this guy's early life but we have to mention a little bit about it and the reason is there's just not a lot of information out there about this guy early yeah. in life and there's like conflicting yeah stories and stuff like that well there's even conflicting like we don't even know how to spell his last name that's true yeah like we don't know <laughs> so we're kind of i'm guessing when i go for it but um he was what I can say. He was born approximately in 1780. He was either born in France or the French colony of Saint Domingue. <laughs> that can't be the way to pronounce that. Domingue. 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 Domingo. Domingo. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the French colony, whatever became Haiti, it was that French colony, and this is in the Caribbean. So we don't know officially where he was born, but he was associated with French stuff. He he also, um, it was alleged he worked as a blacksmith with his brother Pierre in New Orleans. Um, early, <laughs> I got the pronunciation on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but they, they kind of used the blacksmith business as a front for their smuggling side hustle, which was all the pirate stuff that we'll talk about. Um, a lot of the stuff they were smuggling though was kind of, uh, I mean, it was like, it was like slave trade stuff in mm-hmm. Louisiana. So it's like they're smuggling and contributing to that whole thing. I mean, they are in the South. Yeah. So and they are um, pirates and it's the 1800s. Yeah. One of the other stories that I heard about his early life is that 
here's the other story. So we already mentioned that one. He was born around 70, 80, either in France or this or Haiti. Mm -hmm. Um, But this other story says that he was born in France. Um, Him and Alexander were growing up together, but Pierre was the oldest one and their single mother couldn't take care of all three of them. So she sent Pierre to New Orleans um, (laughs) with like distant relatives to like live there. So then when um, John and Alexander go grow older, that's when they have that mutual connection there. So they're able to like establish themselves in New Orleans. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So, and then I guess the, yeah, blacksmiths. That makes sense. That's a front. So that's pretty much like his early life in a nutshell, but where the meat of this character comes from is when he's his piracy and his privateering. And this is kind of, I mean, this these are like all historical events that I, I guess people in Louisiana and I, even Texas, this is kind of a well-known guy, but I didn't know any of this stuff. And basically, so what they had in 1810, so they have this base it, uh, at Barataria Bay Inlet, and this is a bay in the Gulf of Mexico. And specifically, I think it's on Grand Taree Island. That's kind of where they have this like pirate base. And this is south of New Orleans, west of the <laughs> Mississippi Delta. And this space here, so this like uh, Baratania Bay, it's 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 actually not as big as I thought it was, but it's kind of big. So it's it's 15 miles long and 12 miles wide. So 24 kilometers long or 19 kilometers wide. That's like actually not that big of a space to me. Like, right, if, if you're operating, you know, you have fleets of pirate ships and you have like a thousand men. It's like they're kind of all over the place. Like that's not a big space to me. It is. It's big, but like, like how are you not able to police that? You know, they kind of yeah. just controlled it. That's true. But I mean, a small island off the coast of the mainland U.S. They don't really care what happens there. I guess, yeah. Well, they should though, because their merchant ships are all getting fucked. I guess. <laughs> You know what I, I mean? don't know. Like, yeah, it does seem weird that it's just like a small little island and they're just like, ah, we yeah. can't get to them. It's it's captured. It's theirs now. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. It's probably like five kilometers away and they're like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I thought that was, but that probably had to do with his connections. I, I think like, I think because, you know, he's rubbing elbows with people, they probably like look the other way sometimes. And he probably honestly smuggled shit for a lot of people <laughs> and they're like well we'll just look the other way yeah and um he probably didn't attack u.s ships so it's just the european ships so initially America's like whatever fuck it yeah let let him capture those ships and then just steal their goods we, and sell it we'll to us for cheaper other, yeah, we'll look the other way but um I that actually makes sense gets in trouble later on yeah when he gets a little greedy yeah then we'll yeah we'll get to that but no that's a good point because that would make sense right because if you're Basically, it's like plausible deniability. You can just be like, oh, I was supposed to get this shipment from Spain, but a pirate got it <laughs> and then sold me it for half the price, you know, and then you, you don't pay Spain because you didn't get the you didn't get it. Yeah. But you're getting it on the side from uh, Jean Lafitte. Yeah. And I mean, nothing has changed since then. I mean, it's the same. <laughs> like that's, that's basically how governments still operate today. Um. Yeah. All right. Anyways, so this is about again. Sorry. The next point I had in my notes was like that this area was difficult to monitor by authorities, but it's like I don't think it was. I think it was just like we just already talked about. It's kind of. I think there was agreements because it's not that big. Mm -hmm. So, but in that's what they say. They're like this area was difficult to monitor, so there was a lot of pirateering going on or privateering or whatever. But I think there's more to the story there. So Lafitte, he managed this large fleet of pirates and privateers um, in the location. And I guess he had 10 ships. So at the time, that was a lot. I was kind of underwhelmed when I read that. I thought he was going to have like a thousand ships. Mm-hmm. That, like He had 10 ships. But, you know, well, I guess. Yeah. I yeah. think in general, general, like that Louisiana area, they just were... They didn't have a lot of troops in any aspect of military, so somebody with 10 ships and 1,000 men could, like, 
go in and kind of conquer that area. And then you think about the British who want to invade that area and have like hundreds of ships, 10,000 men. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it yeah. kind of aids to his story and how he eventually uh, gains so much power. Right. Before we continue the episode, if you're enjoying our caffeinated and crazy podcast, the people you hang out with probably will too. Do us a solid and please pass on this episode to your social media friends on Facebook, Twitter, or other platforms. We would definitely appreciate your support. I'd also like to take this time to shout out some of our valued listeners. Shout out to MTwitch27, Somid93, Our Cynic Culture, Tin Castle 77 and The Man From Nowhere for being straight gangsters on Instagram. Also shout out to Dana M, Justin M, Thomas G, and George Bojo on Facebook for being beauties. Lastly, shout out to I Talk Paranormal on Twitter for retweeting us. To everyone else, please feel free to reach out and submit your topic or drink recommendations. May good karma and vibes be with all of you. Back to the show. So, so one thing that I, when I was researching this, that I was trying, I didn't understand the, the difference between a pirate and a privateer. So like, because this comes up all the time. So basically the difference is a privateer is a private person or ship that engages in maritime warfare under some commission of war so they're kind of they're they're similar to pirates but not really they're pirates with papers so they have like an official government order to operate yeah they're like contracted yeah killers (laughs) exactly yeah so yeah so they kind of it's not like they're not completely rogue they're kind they're operating under some jurisdictions mandate in international waters so, so what that means is that that's kind of important because I think in some cases, like they would use that to like, say they boarded a ship and like stole a bunch of shit. They'd be like, well, no, but I was hired by this governor or this politician. Like they told me to do that. So it's like, get mad at them, not me kind of thing. But yeah, and, and it could also be like, um, from other governments too, like other countries, they could grant you this privateering yeah. order that allows you to like board ships that they, they think are unauthorized. Yeah. But I think what ultimately happens is that just becomes like the excuse for everything. They're mm-hmm. like, you just take down a ship and you're like, Oh, this guy hired me. Yeah. I got a license yeah. for this. I got a license to kill. <laughs> so one of the other things, so that's like the difference between pri- pirates and privateers. But one of the interesting facts I found with uh, Jean Lafitte himself is his crew actually was made up of a variety of nationalities. So like, what am I trying to say here? It was, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, it's like a paradox. Like they were both very inclusive, but completely uninclusive because they're in the slave trade. Mm, So they actually had free men of color and runaway slaves working with them like as free men, but at the same time they're carrying slaves. So it's like, doesn't really make sense. I mean, it happened. But that's what, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's a business, so yeah. whoever wants can get involved, whoever's able to. And I guess this is one way to get involved and like make a pretty good living. Yeah. Um, if you just become a pirate. <laughs> they had um so like Yankees, Portuguese, Norwegians, Frenchmen, um, Creoles, Seminoles, and Cajuns. That's what I have. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> Why are Norwegians here? I don't remember them being first settlers of the U.S. I don't know. They're everywhere, They're man. They're just great sailors, I guess. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about Norway. I don't know. Do you know anything about Norway? Yeah, a little bit. I don't know. What do they do there? The Norwegian <laughs> things? <laughs> I mean, they, they do a lot of uh, fishing and stuff. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay. A lot of uh, salmon comes from there. They're salmon, salmon people. Yeah. Because they're so, like, so close to the north that you know, they have a lot of same things as Canada does, really. They also have a lot of oil in Norway as well. So Makes sense. It's a very big business over there. And in that side of the world, the government um, keeps all the revenues and reinvests <laughs> it for their citizens' retirement. All that oil money, 
Yeah. So just a fun fact about Norway, um, like every citizen has like 1.5 million upon retirement. Like that's what their pension fund is. Yeah. Because of all the oil money that the government just like reinvests into the people. That's crazy. Interesting. Okay. (laughs) I didn't know that. Um, so this, this, uh, basically the crew of Jean Lafitte, they're called the Baratarians. And I mean, the reason is because they're in that Barataria, Barataria Bay. And they become, that's what they become known as. And like, that's, that's what they're referred to as. So one thing, this kind of goes when I was making the distinction between the pirates and the uh, privateers, Jean Lafitte, he actually insisted that he was a privateer and not a pirate. Um, uh, he, he didn't like being classified as a pirate. He was actually funny enough, more land-based than anything else. Like he was more of a land-based businessman than, uh, a pirate at sea. Like he kind of operated, you know, he was more of the brains of the operation. Like, it's not like that he was on the ships actually doing this stuff. He was kind of coordinating things. Um, so I have this, the city of Cartagena in present-day Colombia, they rebelled against Spain and gave permission through letters of marquee for privateers. And this included some of Jean Lafitte's men. And so, so they were hired essentially as privateers to capture Spanish ships and, you know, whatever goods or slaves they had on board. So they kind of had that, again, they had that contract. So... Jean Lafitte, he was kind of his impression of everything was like, okay, I'm licensed to do this shit in the Gulf of Mexico. But I think the United States, they didn't recognize the government of Cartagena as a a legal entity. So like the US, you know, they were just like, no, we that's what you're saying. But really, what you're doing is just attacking ships that you see. And just being like, no, we have, you know, we were granted this by this government. Mm hmm. But in the eyes of the U.S., that government didn't actually exist officially. That was my reading of it. I don't know. So so this is kind of where, you know, he's kind of stirring the pot in the Gulf of Mexico because the U.S. is like, no, we're charging your crew with piracy. But Jean Lafitte, he's like, no, I'm a privateer. Um, so I don't actually know, you know, where the truth is on that. But that's that's kind of what happened. And I guess he was causing havoc in the Gulf of Mexico. So like um, they were capturing British ships, American ships and Spanish Spanish merchant ships. And, you know, it was just it was just shitty. And I know one thing I found was um, so it was illegal to bring slaves from Africa into Louisiana. That was like a, a, a rule that was passed in the United States. And. Then it later became illegal to import slaves to the rest of the United States. But the Louisiana planters, they were having a hard time buying enough American-born slaves to work on their like sugar and cotton plantations because I guess that industry was expanding. So they had like a demand for labor, uh, but they weren't allowed that labor. So like this is where, you know, because of that, Jean Lafitte, they became like a, a massive smuggling like entity essentially operating in that region because like right the 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 plantation owners they they were like eager to buy whatever they could from Lafitte yeah and um like just because the U.S. outlawed it doesn't mean other countries in the area didn't like Mm -hmm. modern day Colombia they probably still had slaves coming from Africa um so that way Jean Lafitte was able to like smuggle yeah into uh, louisiana yeah that way so it's not like all import of um i guess foreign or exotic slaves yeah i guess yeah that would be the term i suppose yeah yeah (laughs) wasn't all all banned across the globe yet no so So, and like so okay this is one thing because i was saying like the area is actually not that big that they're controlling and operating in so like why can't you police it But one of the reasons was uh, Jean Lafitte and his crew, they were experts in navigating swamp terrain. So I guess in that region, there's a lot of swamps. And, you know, I think we have to remember at this time, like, it's not like you have Google Maps, right? 
it's not it's not like you have like satellite images to like navigate and stuff so you, your knowledge of the terrain is actually like really important and they knew the swamp area well and they had like quick getaways um already planned well ahead so there was like several times where customs officials or soldiers they would try to capture jean lafitte in the swamp but instead of capturing him they would either get wounded or killed by the baratarians or baratarians rather so it, that's the other thing too it's like even if you want to police them it's like you're risking your life because they're probably just going to kill you because they're better yeah another thing to note is when lafitte was younger um he grew up in this like swampy area so he liked to explore and that's how like since a child he was exploring the swamps and knew the ways around better than anyone else in louisiana and that's actually like what made him such a good smuggler was if you're boarding ships and stealing all the stuff you can't just go to like the major ports what you have to do is like take it from the larger ships into smaller ships and navigate through the swamps to get to some merchant um, towns or merchant Hmm. areas so that's why like years of just smuggling things through those swamps also helped him Um, yeah that makes sense yeah okay So they were avoiding the main ports by going through the swamps and that eventually led to them becoming experts in that area better than anyone else. So they were able to exploit the dangers of the swamp um, against like as a defense and uh, a good route for them. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes more sense why they would be uh, taking those routes instead of like the main routes. Him growing up, like, yeah, if he's exploring that area constantly. Like no one else knows the backwoods like he does, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Jean Lafitte. <laughs> so this motherfucker, he um basically okay, so he's doing this, they're kind of running shit at this point. In eighteen twelve, the Lafitte brothers, um, they're they're arrested and they're put on trial. But they just escape jail. Like they just get out, no problem, they're done. And at their trial date, they just don't show up because, like, why? Why would you? <laughs> so they just they escape jail. Don't even don't even care. They're they're on their own. So at this is when at this point the governor of Louisiana puts a bounty on uh, Jean Lafitte, and yeah. then Jean Lafitte's like he's just like at this point he's like fuck you like I run this shit like no I'm putting a five thousand dollar bounty on you. So I can't even imagine that. It's like what what is that like? It's just like it's just like someone overthrowing like because we're, we're in Canada. It's like someone overthrowing like Trudeau and just being like, no. Like I run the house. Well, yeah. At this point, like you have the money <laughs> and like the power, so you have all these men working for you. The city loves you, and you have the ability to pay them what the more way more than the government is willing to pay. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, and we're in this, it's actually not that different than how politics operates today. Because it's like there is lobby groups and there is like powerful people that have like backdoor deals to get certain uh you know to leverage certain policy or lever or have people look the other way for things it's actually not that different it's actually exactly the same as <laughs> yeah except- pretty much it's just not as known yeah and today. you can't call for like the death of someone but you can you can definitely sway governments to uh, yeah well i mean check the clinton body count like it's like you can it's just it's not official. But not in, a, not in a general way like this. Like this was a bounty yeah. poster uh, for the governor yeah. all across <laughs> yeah. the city. You can't do that. <laughs> but I mean, I guess there's some right. back end backroom deals that can happen and yeah. emails that can be sent. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was like one of our Patreon exclusive episodes, uh, the Marconi mur- murders. Um, all these scientists just get murdered and like suicided out of nowhere because they had information that would have given them an advantage against the U.S., <laughs> in uh in wartime so it's kind of i don't know like yeah it's like basically i know what you're saying yeah you can't publicly you can't like put out a facebook marketplace like oh here's a bounty for this yeah <laughs> yeah the game's the same it just it's played differently yeah yeah that's interesting i mean all the historians out there are laughing at us they're like yeah that's kind of how history it repeats itself <laughs> money is power or what's the saying it doesn't necessarily repeat history doesn't repeat but it rhymes it's like yeah it's the same shit it's just different. Like, there's probably, you know, 200 years from now, people will look back and they'll be like a Jean Lafitte. He's not a pirate in 2020, but it's like just some guy who's like doing backdoor deals and like fucking everyone over. Yeah. George Soros. Bitcoin. Bill Gates. 
Well, I mean, the creator of Bitcoin. Yeah. We won't get into Satoshi it, but somewhere. Like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Somebody that just creates a currency and decentralizes yeah. everything. It's crazy. That could be like the Jean Lafette of the future. No, that, yeah, actually, yeah, just disruptive. Um, so, okay, where, where was I on this? So he puts this hit on the governor and basically, yeah, so he's, he's at large at this point and he's, he's continues doing business with other merchants and, um, and it, it, it's like, again, this is again, looking back on history. It's like, of course, you're just going to buy the cheapest price. You know what I mean? Like people know that he's a criminal and they know that he's stealing his stuff, but they're like, he's like, I can give it to you for half off. So you buy it. It's kind of like in today's terms, like everybody complains about fucking Amazon and shit, but it's like everybody uses it. Yeah. It's like, you know, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say about it. I actually don't have that belief, but I hear it all the time. It's like, you're going to buy the cheap good, you know, like, like you go, you know what I mean? Like you're going to do it. Yeah. And especially if like, you're a merchant or a middleman of this stuff you want it at the cheapest price so you can get the most profit from it like if you're buying it for your personal use then um yeah there's like you might not always choose the cheapest option but if you're somebody like that's trying to make a profit off it yeah you're gonna choose the cheapest option well i mean even cell phones like look at the materials that it takes to construct a cell phone it's like there's there's like basically slave labor involved with that and everybody has a cell phone it's not like anybody's yeah renouncing their cell phone there's like the one saint that you know they don't wear shoes and they smell like shit and they live you know and you know like you know those guys they have that opinion they're like i don't do anything yeah. bad it's like yeah but you suck i don't want to hang out with you <laughs> like it's like you smell like shit <laughs> you always you're always asking me to spot you five bucks <laughs> spot me five yeah th there's those guys and I mean, those are the saints of our times. <laughs> um, anyways, so, and I guess the other thing too, he's at large, he's running around selling shit. People don't care because they're getting cheap prices. Uh, Jean Lafette, he's the fucking Jeff Bezos of the time. He's, <laughs> he's not really at all, but. I'd say he's like the Pablo Escobar like, of the time. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> he's, uh, I don't know, he's just, he's. He's the Elon Musk of the time. <laughs> I don't. Well, he didn't invent anything crazy. He's just no. He's a criminal. He's a. He's a, no. He's a hardcore. Uh, you're right. Um. Yeah, the, those people aren't criminals. So. El Chapo of the time. Yeah, that's a better analogy. I just trying to. I'm trying to pump his tires. He's running around. He's got. He's a great entrepreneur. He's doing all this shit. Um. But the authorities, here's the thing, because it's 1812, the War of 1812 is happening, so they're preoccupied trying to defend the United States against, you know, Spain, Britain, and their allies. So I think they kind of look the other way, right? They can't really monitor this guy. So he's just having a heyday. Just a straight heyday. Like, there's no stopping this guy. Um, So this kind of brings us to... The War of eighteen twelve, which he was highly a part of. On my research, basically, I found Jean Lafitte. He was first approached by the British, so they, I think, they knew of him, right? Because he was probably blowing up their ships and like stealing their stuff, probably fucking all their women too. <laughs> and, and they just got sick of it. They're just like, <laughs> leave, leave some of that poon for us, Jean Lafitte. Like <laughs> he fucked my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my wife <laughs> it's my british accent <laughs> he uh um so they approach him and they, they realize that he's probably going to be a useful ally if they're in a war with the united states because he controls that gulf of mexico space and they're impressed um i think they even tried to get through the british set up a blockade in the mississippi delta and jean lafitte and his crew they like just went right through it like they they didn't even they couldn't stop them. So they're like, fuck, well, like we can't even control this area. So like, let's get this guy on board. So they offered him, they made him an offer and you know, the British, they, they're like, we'll make you a naval rank. We'll give you an official naval rank. You'll be captain. We'll give you financial compensation. And I think they were going to give him 30,000 pounds, which at the time 
was if you put it in today's dollars, that's more than $2 million today. And they said that they were going to pardon his previous criminal activities. That was their offer. And I don't think Jean Lafitte liked that offer because in my view, like I don't know how much a merchant vessel is, but I'm assuming if you seize a merchant vessel, it's more than two million. I bet you it's more than thirty thousand pounds. Yeah, I think um, like from some of the stories that I heard, like his operations were bringing in eighteen thousand eighteen thousand pounds, like a day or a week or whatever. So that, that's peanuts. So yeah. yeah, like in two weeks, he's already making that. Yeah. So it's kind of not the best offer, but he. So what he decides to do, he kind of like pretends, like he plays coy. He's like, oh, I'll think about it. Give me two weeks. But he just straight up lies to them. Um, like he kind of gave them the impression he was going to think about it. But then he just like immediately went behind their back. So <laughs> Yeah, I think um, actually like what had happened there was um, his older brother, Pierre, was in jail. So he was caught doing crimes. So he was in jail. And then he saw this as a way to get his brother out of jail. Yeah. was to tell the Americans that the British were planning to invade and what their plans were and then use that as like as a leverage. Leverage, move. yeah. Yeah. Was it Pierre or was it Alexander? I think it was the older one, Pierre. Okay. So, so yeah, he, he goes to uh, New Orleans and he, and he tells them about the plan. So it, I think he was kind of thinking that they would – value his intel right um you know that he's like i didn't side with them but that's not even what happened so september 16th 1814 the governor at the time was named governor wcc clarborn <laughs> or clyborn he he listens you know he's like okay i hear you i hear you but he just ends up attacking jean lafitte's base in the the barataria bay so he I don't know, he just like takes the information and then attacks him. Jean Lafitte manages to escape that attack though, and he escapes inland. So they didn't catch him. And, you know, they didn't trust him. They just decided to take the information and attack him. And then under the leadership of US Commodore Daniel Patterson, um, the Navy, they end up just destroying the pirates' buildings and they capture 80 of his men. And in that seizure, this is where Alexander comes. So when they seize that area, they, they capture 80 of his men as well as uh, Jean Lafitte's brother, um, Alexander. So they kind of like what, what happened here. So basically Jean Lafitte, he backstabs the, the British offer and then the New Orleans authorities backstab Jean Lafitte. That's kind of my reading of what happened. Yeah. They're just like. They're like, no, fuck this pirate. We're not They're working like, with him. They double cross the double cross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't trust you can't trust a pirate, you can't trust the British, and you can't trust um the United States. The governor. <laughs> the governor. <laughs> now, I think what happens here next, basically. So this this is 1814, December. Now, so this is what, three months later? Yeah. General Andrew Jackson comes into play now. And I think he has a different attitude towards things. Like he doesn't see it like all oh, this dirty, filthy pirate. Like we have to stop him at all costs. He's kind of like, what can I gain from this? Like how can we use him to help us? So he starts working with uh, Jean Lafitte. And I should mention here, like General Jackson, he did despise the Baratarians. Like he didn't like that they're operating in the Gulf of Mexico and all this shit. But he was desperate for military support, and he knew that Jean Lafitte had, you know, a lot of arms. He had gunpowder. He had cannonballs. He had the manpower, and just the knowledge of the terrain, I guess, as well. It's probably going to be a factor. Yeah, I also think that uh, Andrew Jackson, like, knew of the British's plans now. So it's been a few months, and they've probably gotten tips that, you know, this is actually a plan. There, the British are coming, and they're invading that Louisiana area. Right. So it's like you kind of have like what are the, what else can you do? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> and as I mentioned before, like it was a very ill-equipped area, not a lot of men, not a lot of soldiers to fight. So Jackson, seeing that these plans are actually going to happen, he has no choice but to side with, you know, Lafette, yeah. who knows the area, has men, has the weapons um, to try and help yeah. him fight. Like even if 
they lose, it's still a chance that they have against the British rather than just like kind of surrendering immediately. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you're going to fight the pirates and the British. Like, what are you going to like? Yeah. Okay. That makes it. That's interesting though, because it's like, it's almost like, um, I don't even know. It's it's like, it's like, well, again, I was going to say it's like, it's like allowing the Mexican cartel or something to like, help you with stuff but it's like didn't the cia do that already like yeah never mind yeah <laughs> same shit different day <laughs> didn't that already happen <laughs> yeah that's what like governments do they like fund the militia or the yeah. uprisings and then once they establish control it's like hey now you help us yeah same thing happened in like iran and yeah all these arabic countries it's like it's hey just... here's weapons money whatever you need to get control of the country and then scratch our backs it's just funny because it's like I'm so um, uh, not savvy with uh, history. Like that's not my field of expertise. So when I like hear read stuff in the past, I'm like, hey, that's kind of – they shouldn't have done that. That's kind of bad. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> they do that. They literally did that yesterday. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's the same shit. <laughs> it's like <laughs> – yeah, never mind. So anyways – um. Lafayette, he he agrees and he commands his men to fight. Um, but what he also got a bargain out of this. So in exchange for his allyship, they release his captured men and they release his brother. So his men they act as cannoneers and swamp guides for the U.S. troops. Like we said, this so the swamp that was kind of their. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here. That was their guerrilla warfare tactic. Yeah. Yeah, they they knew it was just it's like they had a, you know, a plus 50 percent attack bonus in that terrain or whatever. (laughs) Like, you know, like it's that's what they get. They get a bonus for swamp land. So. um, (laughs) They're very nimble in the swamp terrain. Um, I just try to use the word nimble every time I get the opportunity. (laughs) So um, anyways. So they helped with that. And that's kind of what like the pirate turn patriot kind of stuff happens. But there's another battle. So the Battle of New Orleans, this is January 8th, 1815. So the British attack the city, but ultimately with the help of Jean Lafitte, they could defend the city. And I read, I don't know how accurate this is, but I read it, it took about 25 minutes and the British were fucked. Like it was like a quick battle. They They came... And in within 25 minutes, it's like the battle was basically won. That's how overwhelming um, Lafitte and uh, the U.S. naval forces were against the British in that battle. Yeah. Some of the numbers that I heard was in that, like, okay, let's say it is 25 minutes, but the British lost like 200 soldiers, whereas the Americans only lost like 71 mm-hmm. those soldiers. So it was like a very big disadvantage. And then the British just kind of gave up. Yeah. So I have a quote from uh, Jean Lafitte um, about how how he was feeling after this Battle of New Orleans. The qu- quote. I was almost out of breath, running through the bushes in the mud. My hands were bruised, my clothing torn, my feet soaked. I could not believe the results of the battle. End quote. That's, uh, that's the best British or French accent we could come up with. That is Jean Lafitte. <laughs> He's very assimilated in the, into the Louisiana culture. <laughs> and you can tell that he had he was good with words, a smooth talker, yeah. very polite. <laughs> so basically, uh, for his invaluable aid in that battle, he and his thousand men, they're pardoned by President James Madison. So, well, here, one thing that's interesting, so they got the pardon, they're not going to get charged with all their shit, um, but they never got that base back in Barataria. Um, so although they were pardoned, I think he was kind of still like pissed off. He's like, well, like, yeah, you pardoned me, but you fucked my entire operation because you took that base. Yeah. So he just like went back to crime. I heard a different story. Um, so the president couldn't pardon them because that would cause like an uprising from all the people. So he just let them escape out of prison and was like, Hey, we're not actually going to like chase you down. You guys are free to go, but we can't pardon you because it's going to cause an uprising. I see. So they just like open the doors and we're like, go be free. <laughs> but yeah, and then that's why they didn't get their base back or anything. So they have to like, like, okay, well, what are we, what are we good at? 
he asked his men, and they all said, crime. <laughs> Pirating. Yeah. <laughs> Cocaine. <laughs> Pillaging and raping. Yeah. <laughs> The one like gay pirate in the back was sucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> they killed that guy, <laughs> hung him. Yeah, they actually did. Like, oh, never mind. That's a, uh, that is a story that I heard though, back in the day. What story? Oh, that they um, hung the gays. No, I think maybe we'll get into it later, but if not, I'll just mention it now. Um, yeah, just mention so it. So eventually the U.S. starts chasing Lafette again because of his crimery. Uh, <laughs> and then they're like, hey, you've been attacking our ships. And then at this base, he hangs one of his men. And he's like, oh, no, yeah, this guy did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we get into Yeah, it, we but, do get into okay. that. Um, Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, what was I? Oh, I had another point to make. Oh, so here's something interesting. So where that battle happened, um, the Battle of New Orleans, they actually made a national park there, um, and it's called Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve. What I thought was interesting, it's like a missing four one one connection. Just because it's a national park. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Do people go missing there? I don't know. They get just, they get abducted by pirates. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jean Lafes ghost. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so okay, so you're right. So he, so I didn't actually. So they, it, it could be an official pardon, but maybe not. Maybe it was what you were saying, where it was just like an unofficial pardon. But anyways, whatever the case is, they go to this place called Galveston, and so in 1817, now Lafitte and his 100 loyal men. They operate 20 ships. So they've like doubled their, what would you say, their operation? I would, based on the numbers. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, so they're attacking merchant ships of the Spanish em- Empire. And, you know, they're again, they're just profiting because they can sell the captured cargo and whatever else, the arms and the slaves for less. And they're making a fuckload of money. And this time they're operating out of Campeche, which later becomes Galveston, Texas. So he went from Louisiana to Texas, and it's crazy. It's this guy reminds me of like fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger. He later becomes governor in 1819. <laughs> like he's a pirate governor. I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, he, it's like he kind of get to the pirate ship. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get to the pirate ship. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's just crazy. Like he, he's a criminal, become patriot, become politician. It just doesn't make sense. Crazy story. Now, we kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but essentially at this point, like he's, you know, he's the governor, and he still has his operation. So one day he gets really greedy, and he actually starts attacking. He attacks a U.S. merchant ship, and he's not supposed to do that. So they send the U.S. sends a warship to check out what was going on in Galveston because they heard wind that uh, Jean Lafitte had attacked a merchant ship. And this is what you were saying. They come with the warship and they're like, hey, man, what the fuck's going on? And he just like hangs one of his guys and he's like, who's that guy? Yeah, <laughs> I already I already hung him, though. Yeah, he's like, don't worry, we solved it. This guy is. A f- <laughs> he went rogue. Yeah, this guy's a fucking asshole. There's a misunderstanding. He was also gay, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, did I tell you he was also gay? And they're like, mm. "Good, <laughs> good at what he does, yeah. but gay." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that impressed them, so they <laughs> they just let it go. <laughs> but basically, he just kept on being a pirate. He's just like, "Yeah, fuck it." And then again, he attacks another U.S. merchant ship. So they send another warship in 1821. Um, but this time. Um, there wasn't any, he didn't have, he didn't have anybody to scapegoat. So he's just like, he's like, all my men are straight. (laughs) What are you talking about? (laughs) My 1000 loyal boys. (laughs) They're all straight. (laughs) They wouldn't have done this. So he has no scapegoat. So he basically, he escapes on a single ship called the pride. The gay pride. Or like (laughs) a lion's pride, you know? And he's the lion and everyone else is just his bitch. <laughs> Couldn't be that too. I was just thinking he has like a thousand 
the pride, the pride vessel. Hey, yeah, just... me and my thousand boys here, we're just going good away. <laughs> That's what I kind of pictured it as. Like, hey, <laughs> just rainbow flags, like a fucking rave. That is Jean Lafette. Say what you want about him, and he knows how to party. And it's just like a bunch of music. Like, what's that song? I don't know. I'm. T- it's raining. Yeah, exactly. They're just like, <laughs> they're just like partying. They're dressed as pirates and shit, and like, and they sailed away. They got away. It's just it's ridiculous. <laughs> so basically, they they get away. I, I allegedly this is kind of the end of his history, but they start they keep doing pirate stuff for a while, but ultimately his fate is unknown. So he just got away, sailed off into the sunset with a thousand men. Just him and his boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the pride. It's yeah. Weird. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of cool to be like that. It's an unknown ending. So, uh, let your imagination run wild there. There's some, like, well, Hey, uh, listen, this is a swerve podcast and I solved the ending and we'll get into it. They just had gay sex for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> is that what and you want to say? <laughs> I'm joking. I don't um, I don't believe that, but they probably believed that at the time. But no, I actually. So I have um, this is the thing. I go I go deep. I found I have two stories. I can say the fate was unknown, but actually there is some information you can find. Crazy pirate. He gets away. Now there's two pieces of evidence we have to can complete the story. The first one was allegedly there was a journal that purported. It, it was it allegedly belonged to John uh, Lafitte, and this surfaced in nineteen in the nineteen forties, and it alleged that he moved to St. Louis, where he assumed a new life as Jean Laflin, <laughs> <laughs> or Laughlin. I don't know. <laughs> John Laughlin. Um, according to the journal, he married and had a son with a woman named. Emma Mortimer, and according to that account, he died in Alton, Illinois in 1854 at the age of 70. The issue with this journal is we cannot verify its authenticity, so it's just kind of a piece of the story. I don't know if it's true, but that's what the journal says. Yeah, that's kind of why we have issues like finding out about his early life is that it was a pretty common name. So there was a lot of Jean Lafettes around, and a lot of them did have the occupation of like sailor or captain. So um, it's really hard to find information on this guy, uh, early life, and even in this later life. So this journal could have belonged to somebody else named Jean Lafette. But but this is true. So the journal for me was uninspiring because like, I wanted an end to the story. But here's – I found – okay – so you can actually find, I don't know if you came across this or not, but there's like this mother-daughter duo. <laughs> Why does that make I think I've up? seen that video. You think you've seen that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so her name is Dr. Ashley Oliphant and Beth Yarbrow. And in March 2021 they released um, a story based on two years of research they did. And I think they solved the case of Jean Lafitte and what happened to him. Um, it's funny because you, it's if you go on YouTube and you find, you try and find this, this video has like 1,300 views. Yeah. Um, and it, so it's what I'm saying is it's not like, I don't know, it's not that well known. Okay. And it's, it's recent. This is March 2021. Okay, so we're breaking some... Uh... We're breaking some news. We're breaking ground here. Here on the Swear Fucking Podcast. So they allege that based on their research, Jean Lafitte faked his death in the 1820s. So kind of when he was escaping, that he he faked his death and then he hid in Cuba. So he comes inland from Cuba during the cotton boom and he uses a fake name called Lorenzo Fier. Um, <laughs> and it's crazy because it's... Essentially what happens here, so all the research that this mother-daughter daughter duo are using, it's all based on primary documents, and all the primary documents are verified by researchers. They took it to independent historians, 
and they had their documents verified. So it's not like they're everything that they say is based on a primary historical document. It's not like a journal where they couldn't verify it. Okay. These are these are the name of Lorenzo Friere in certain writings and certain communications. They found letters um, of communication hiding a man named Lorenzo Fier, and he was also he used a fake an even more fake name. It was like this house that um, Jean Lafayette owned, and it was called. I'm gonna fuck it up. I don't have it. <laughs> I don't have it here. But it was it was a French word for like. I want to say like red or something, whatever the French word Rouge. is. Something like it was like, yeah, the La Rouge. That's what he called his house. Uh. But like he was using it as a fake name in these communications. So he was talking with someone to like hide him. And he was using the fake. He was using his house as the name. Okay. And they through going through these letters and going through, um, you know, like, what would you say? Like deeds to things and mm-hmm. like newspapers and stuff. They're like, yeah, this was who he was he was lorenzo fier and he was in cuba and that's what happened he faked his death and it all lines up and it took them two years to research it and they had to travel through seven states and they went around and they got all the documents and they're like yeah this is what happened huh. and this is this is like recent yeah and there was like a story of one of the stories of his death is in around 1820 they were attacked by a spanish ship their one ship and you know yeah that's where he died so I guess that was the fake and went to Cuba. Yeah. they it's close enough. They wrote a book about it. And yeah. so I thought that was amazing. It's like, what the fuck? So it, because this is liter- literally, I mean, we're from Canada. So like, I never heard of this at all. But I guess in Louisiana and Texas, this is like a big thing. Like the national parks named after him. Yeah. There's like streets named after him and, and like bars. Like Galveston, Texas, they still have like his base. Yeah. Like the original stairs there. So you could go visit. Yeah. And that's, they actually solved the the mystery. Yeah. Who would have known mother, daughter duo be useful for something else too? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, so, I mean, that kind of takes me to the end here. I don't know. Do you want to do some final thoughts on this? Yeah, I do. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, what are we doing here? I think um, just a reflection. Yeah, overall, I think it's a pretty crazy story how how keen governments are working with criminals, even in today's age. It just seems like a constant throughout history. Um, how much power criminals can actually have, like just money and respect, um, can get you a long way. But yeah, I think the story is pretty cool, and uh, I think America really really owes this guy because he did save them from the british invasion which could have changed the course of american history as we know it uh just by him you know defending that area and i think it's actually really cool that we we have these documents recent documents march 2021 yeah that kind of proved the story and you know what happened to him because him sailing off in the sunset and everything being unknown it, it kind of <laughs> leaves you longing for more, you know, but actually I want to know what happened with all the men. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, com- com- <laughs> coming down to the bottom of it uh, or getting down to the bottom of it is pretty cool. Yeah. And I think it, it just adds to a story like how many other how many times have we discussed people that fake their own death and they just like keep doing what they're doing under a fake name. And it's just like the hustle, the grind. It never stops. Yeah. Just the name changes. Like even. Yeah. That's right. That's my final thoughts. I think it's a really cool story. And thank you, Justin M., for requesting this topic. Uh, I enjoyed researching and learning about it. And we hope that uh, you enjoyed it as well, as well as the other listeners. Yeah, that's kind of my final. I mean, honestly, I'm going to say the same shit as you. I think one thing that I can reflect on that's a little bit different, though, is. So this is one thing that I find interesting because I'm not familiar with how historians operate. But I think it's really cool that basically if you're a historian, your research methodology is just to find primary documents and then make a story. That's it. Like that's literally all you do. Like people write about things in books and like you can use that as a reference. But what those books are based on is primary documents. So like if you're a historian like these like these people, it's not like 
you know, they just like decided to do it one day. They just went out and were like, let's see what we can find. And then they, you, you make your own conclusion based on whatever you can find. So you could do that for like anything. And you could be like, no, this is actually more act. This is based on this document, this document, this fucking newspaper clipping and this fucking, you know, like journal yeah. thing. This is what I think happened. And it's like, you would be right. Because it's like, it's just based on what you find. You know what I mean? Like, if there's nothing else new coming in or there's nothing different, it's like, it's just your interpretation of the primary documents. Yeah, at this point, you're <laughs> kind of just like an archaeologist digging through documents, yeah. trying to find, you know, the pieces that match. And also, like, there's techniques and stuff like analyzing penmanship and handwriting to, like, yeah, correlate it. But to it's just who they think it was. But yeah, that's, it's not like a science. It's like, a you just take what you have it's and like it's big. like you make up you're like this is what happened it's like uh, yeah it is i guess we have nothing else to base it on unless we find something new so you're right <laughs> it's just whatever you want it to be that's how like it's kind of cool like i don't know that's how most science works though it's like until a better theory is proven the prevailing theory at the time wins so with this one it's just they have the first source documents they've created a story that's more believable than what we've had before and it'll stay that way until other people come around with more evidence if that does happen it's similar yeah i mean i guess it's similar but it's it's also really different it's also because it's just like you just like take you're like yeah this is real like just think of all the stupid emails you have or like stupid like chat messages and it's like those are going to someday be a historical document you know what i mean and it's just like how do you know the only fans messages <laughs> Oh yeah, by the way, uh the mother daughter duo, they are on only <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ashley Oliphant. Yeah, it's, it's a fifty dollar pay per view for these uh documents that they found. <laughs> they actually sponsored the podcast today. <laughs> uh I, I don't know. That's like one thing I could say that's kinda of weird. It's just like historians, you just like talk about shit and like it's kinda of cool. But I mean, aside from that, like yeah, it's um obviously a cool story. This guy's crazy, he's all over the place. I just like it. It made me think about parallels between the past and the future. And it's nice to think about those things. So that's really all I have to say. We can roll out. All right. Let's do it. it. Let's, uh, first and foremost, let's thank Sidestepping the Sun for making the intro and outro music to the podcast. Shout out to um, them for doing that. Also, as always, still unofficial sponsor of the podcast, Ellie could tackle fucking hot sauce. I eat it basically every day. I put it on everything. It's um, a habanero-based hot sauce. Uh, it's 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 spicy. It's not your basic ketchup bullshit. It's, I think just if you, I like spicy food, and if you like spicy food, you're probably going to like it. So I'm just spreading the word. I just love the product. We're unofficially sponsored. I'm going to keep shouting it out until they sponsor the podcast. So, I mean, I guess on that note, um, Please, if you want to tag us in the All You Can Tackle Hot Sauce, you want to reach out to them. I know we've had listeners do this on our behalf. Greatly appreciate that. That's awesome that you do that. Um, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. Slowly but surely, we're making it happen. All You Can Tackle Hot Sauce. Yeah, sponsor us. <laughs> um, I, also, uh, I also want to issue another call to action from our listeners. Uh, if you aren't subscribed to our YouTube, please subscribe. We're trying to get to that thousand subscriber mark as quickly as possible. Um, so that'd be nice if you could do that. And once again, I'd like to mention that we do have a Patreon. If you're still listening, you've enjoyed this episode. You're going to enjoy the other episodes that we have, and we have a lot of them. So with the Patreon, for $1, yes, you heard that right. It's only a dollar uh, a month you can get access to all the bonus episodes that we've done and we will give you a shout out on the podcast uh, we also have that three dollar right uh, slap the ass tier and that'll give you all that bonus content shout outs on the podcast and you'll also get early access to all the episodes you get your own private R rss feed and you can just listen to them on your own time yeah, I think the other thing I want to mention is essentially we put out a new patreon episode exclusive it only gets released on patreon every month. So it's just the same shit we did. So if you've burned through all the content or whatever and you're like, I need more content, it's like one dollar, you get access to all the episodes. So it's pretty it's pretty good, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I can't find a better I mean, value in today's time. I mean we're a kind of shitty podcast, but like 
you I know, mean, we're informative. We're making it work. I mean, we solved the mystery of John Lee Fiat. Yeah, and thankfully this is a main <laughs> main we episode. Solved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I'd like to introduce <laughs> Doctor Oliphant here. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I, I'm I just <laughs> ripped my face off. <laughs> I'm and, Oliphant. Uh, I'm her daughter. Oh, shit. <laughs> Um, we are the mommy daughter duo, <laughs> <laughs> and you can uh, you can listen to us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> we are the mommy daughter duo. One topic, one obscure topic at a yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I want to also mention we have uh, so you don't have to support us on Patreon. I know it's like a monthly contribution. So some people don't like that subscription service we have. So say you just enjoyed an episode and you're like, hey, fuck, I learned some shit. I want to tip these guys. We're on buymeacoffee.com. You know, you want to buy us a coffee. We'll, we'll use that money to buy beans. We'll grind them down. We'll make a bunch of coffees. You know, we're not going to go take the $3 and spend it on a Starbucks. We're going to take that $3 and buy a bunch of fucking beans. We're going to grind them and we're going to drink the coffee. Because it's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Also, uh, we do have some stickers that we can give away to our listeners. Um, there's two ways to get these stickers. One, you either leave a five-star written review on an Apple podcast, take a screenshot and DM it to us on either one of our social medias, give us your address or whatever, and we'll send you some stickers that you can have that are really cool stickers, waterproof, cool designs, and you can just rock that wherever you go. Uh, the other way, if you don't use Apple Podcasts, uh, interact on our social media, like, subscribe on our YouTube, take screenshots of it, you know, reach out to El Yucateco, plead your case. Um, we understand that most some people don't want to use Apple Podcasts, so as long as you show us that you're a loyal listener and, you know, you enjoy what we do, uh, you can get yourself some stickers. And that'd be cool. Something to mention, I learned this this weekend. Some people have iPhones, but they don't know that Apple Podcast is free. They think you have to pay for it. If you have an iPhone, you can have Apple Podcasts. Yeah, it's a default app. Yeah. There's a, I'm not kidding. I met a ton of people. They're like, oh, I didn't know. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like a few years ago is when I got into podcasts. So before that, I didn't know that that, that has always been on my phone. Yeah, if you have an iPhone, you can leave a five-star review for free. And we'll send you stickers for free. I know 50%, based on our analytics, have iPhones. And what you do with the stickers, you know, we don't care. So if you want to yeah. do whatever you want with them, <laughs> <You really. do. laughs> uh, But yeah, as always, just like interact with us. We love to hear from you guys. Uh, if you see a topic and you don't want to do the research yourself, just recommend it to us. Um, I will say that Patreons do get a priority on that. So if a Patreon requests it, we'll try our best to get to it as quickly as possible. Uh, but, you know, we as we are still a small podcast... The general listeners get a say as well. So if you do, you yeah, know, have a have a topic you you want us to research, we'll uh, add it to the list, and eventually we will get to it. Yeah. Do I have anything else to say? I think I do. Oh yeah. So like Izzo mentioned, we're on YouTube, but I know some people don't like YouTube. We're actually also on BitChute. <laughs> Funny enough, we're on BitChute. You can go there and find us. It's another video platform. Um, some of our episodes in the past have actually been flagged on youtube so it's kind of bullshit bitshoot actually has all of our episodes um in video format if you want to check that out but we're also on odyssey.com it's a video it's like it's exactly like youtube except it's based on blockchain technology so it's kind of cool and uh, all of our episodes are on there as well so you can check us out on those platforms as well um what was the other thing we're on anchor right you can like if you want a link that's where our links are for a lot of stuff Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Pandora. I think literally everything. Damn. Tune in. Yeah, you can find like we're honestly on iHeart Radio. You're on iHeart Radio, Stitcher, some Mexican thing. There's <laughs> there's a bunch of shit. I think we're in India. <laughs> like we're on a bunch of shit. I don't we're know why. Yeah, we're all over the place. Um. I don't know. I can stop bullshitting now. I'm just, we're just, I'm groveling at this point. I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking internet grifter. Yeah. I think we've uh, mentioned everything that we have. So thank you for listening yeah. to this episode and please share it with your friends and family. This is the Swerve Podcast. Slap the ass. Ride the wave.
those guys, they have that opinion. They're like, I don't do anything yeah. bad. It's like, yeah, but you suck. I don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> like, it's like, you smell like shit. <laughs> you're, always, you're always asking me to spot you five bucks. <laughs> spot me five. Yeah, th- there's those guys. And I mean, those are the saints of our times. 